I'm just going to hit go live. I saw some guys on YouTube. They had the same microphone, and they had it like over to the side like this. Does that still sound the same? Uh, it sounds pretty much the same. Mm. We'll see. Yep. I uh, I only I, I mean I can do mine at an angle too. It just has to be pointed so specifically at my mouth that I keep it in front primarily to make sure that I don't get out of the target zone. I guess I could go. I could also turn myself sideways. I don't know. Because if I even get a little bit out of the target zone, suddenly I get a lot quieter when <laughs> talking to you, and then back to normal. What if I what if I talk into the side of it like this? How does that work? Actually, that was not significantly quieter. Oh, uh, what if uh, now I you're really far... quiet? Okay, I can't get that <laughs> far away then. I have to stay somewhat close or turn it up, right? Yeah. So, all right, let's mm. get going. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. It's Wednesday, April tenth, two thousand twenty-four. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we are talking about the 2022 anime, The Orbital Children. So yeah, this weekend, there was, uh, if, you, if you didn't watch the news, and it is always amazing to me, there, there were definitely people who did not know this was happening, who were, in fact, right under it. But over a surprisingly large chunk of America, there was a total solar eclipse and i learned a few things that i hadn't really thought about before because we went up to rochester for a bunch of reasons but because the the actual center of totality went basically right over rochester and Leroy, we could be directly under it and mm. uh i didn't realize how dark it gets under the actual totality because i've never been under a totality before yeah, you could you could even see stars and shit right yeah it was dark as night Supposedly. for uh, for yeah. about two minutes yeah, the sun is blocked. If the light isn't reaching you, yep. then it's going to be dark. But if That's you're even like 500 yards outside of the edge of the totality zone, it's not like it's a little bit less dark. It basically doesn't get dark at all. Like, unless you're directly right. under it, it doesn't get dark. Well, it's cause, right. So it's like the, the sun is so powerful, right? It's like, you know, if you blocked out 99% of the sun, but 1% was still, you know, had un restricted access yep. to you through the vacuum of space it's and still crazy air. bright. it's there's like yeah is it a fusion explosion it's crazy bright it can illuminate everything <laughs> <laughs> it'll be darker for sure but it's not you know it'll be like like think about it at sunset right when the sun is setting and it's like there's still a tiny bit of sun on the horizon it's still light out it yeah. doesn't get dark until the sun is all the way gone, completely <laughs> blocked by the other half of the earth, then it's dark, yep. right? There's even a point at which the sun is sort of like co like completely gone, but like the, s the rays of the sun can still sort of curve around the earth and it's still not all the way dark yet. It's just sort of dusky. Yep. So why would the moon getting in the way of most of the sun, right? It has to be completely blocked for it to be dark out. Yep, so we're there, you know, hanging out for the weekend and... uh I did a thing that I didn't think I'd do, and I felt like I should have done it. Uh, and we'll talk, talk about this in more detail on the next Tuesday show. But so, yeah, it was super sunny the day before the eclipse. It was super sunny the day after the eclipse. It was super sunny about an hour after the eclipse ended. And it was pretty sunny about two hours before the eclipse. But during the eclipse, it was maximally cloudy in the entire greater Rochester area. Uh -huh. <laughs> So we're sitting on the roof and we're like, oh, well, I guess we won't see the sun. But we hung out there anyway. And we're like, oh, I guess it's not going to be that exciting. And then it got so dark so fast. And then all the birds around just start freaking out. And it was it was actually really cool to be under that thing. Mm. But uh, well, I went to a movie during the eclipse. <laughs> and, you know, it was cool <laughs> going to a movie theater on a Monday afternoon, which which only has like two employees someone at the at the food stand and someone yeah. checking tickets basically i didn't see anyone else maybe there was someone cleaning theaters uh no one operates the projectors anymore they're automatic no one sells tickets they just have computerized tablet kiosks yeah. that do that right um and it's a very kind of liminal surreal space like an abandoned mall but it's operating and you know the computers are automatically making the screens show the ads in the movies and there were Two or three other people seeing the same movie. Wow, that's more people than were in the theater when we went to see Little Nicky that one time. I guess so. But, <laughs> but it's like they didn't even turn all the lights on in the hallways, so it seemed like half closed <laughs> because I guess they save on electricity. I don't know. But 
Uh, not a bad choice to, of thing to do during an eclipse. You won't get screaming babies or loud people or, you know. Uh, but uh, so in Rochester, I knew, you know, Millennium Games was like our game store when we were in college at RIT. Mm -hmm. And Millennium Games was like, at the time in my life, despite how bad Millennium smelled and how cramped it was, that was the best gaming I mean, store it, I had well, ever, it, ever it had a, experienced. It had a bad smell, but it also had like a like an old bookstore smell that was good, sort of combined. That's true. Like, well, right. it, when certain individuals were not in that store, it just it smelled like old magic cards and library, that's, and I like that's that a smell. Great, yeah, that's the best. Great but of course, smell. when certain people were in the store during uh, magic tournaments and Warhammer tournaments, there was a there was an additional smell. But uh, yeah, but it's like other game. I've never been to another game store. That was basically. I'm sure. I'm sure they exist. But personally, I'm not even gonna lie. I've never been to a game store as good as even the old Millennium that I went <laughs> to when I was in college. That's the right? thing. Like Millennium... in the city, we have Complete Strategist, which has a massive, uh, I guess, uh, stock of games inventory. That's the word, right? A massive inventory of games. But it's this tight little narrow store, and you can only really play games in the dank basement. And like the back hall kind of a scary area. Yeah. And it's not really a great store. They overcharge. They're, they're paying big time Manhattan rents there. And you might right? think like, but that's because New York rent. And yeah, that's true. But there really aren't good game stores in other cities that rent is cheaper in or places where there's low rent like Millennium. Right? I mean, there are good game stores, but they don't have... They're not at that level, right? There's stores that have like a kick-ass community and run lots of good events for all the people, but they don't have the inventory or they're not that big, right? Or, you know, they don't, they can't really get everything in there or, you know, there's, you know, there's the stores you see them like vending at conventions. They got some inventory, but it's like, they don't have the like complete strategist, like is a distributor. They're so big basically, right? Yeah. Um, there's no one who has it all, but Millennium seems to have it all. So a long time, a while back, Millennium moved to like <clears throat> a nearby space that was bigger. And I'd visit it again and Millennium was just like better in every way. And it was already the best gaming store I'd ever been to. And, you know, over the years, don't go to Millennium that often. And I didn't realize they moved a third time. They moved to an absolutely enormous space. And they now brand themselves and even have a trademark on being, quote, the largest game store in the country. Yeah, I believe it. I have no reason to dispute it. It's so, the largest I've seen, and it was the largest I had seen when I saw it, and that was a previous incarnation. They are in a location where the commercial real estate is not that expensive at a time when commercial real estate is down in a lot but of But also, they are... They and are we got a shit ton of nerds living real close by. Yeah, you've got U of R, you've got RIT, and you've got the city of Rochester, which is not a that small a city, all right there. Yep. Mostly RIT, though, right? It's yeah. like this place where there's nerds who come to live there for four to five years at a time, and new nerds every year, right, looking for nerds. And times. also, every nerd who ever goes to RIT and cares about games goes to Millennium Elise once and then mythologizes it like we do and then comes back and realizes that wasn't a myth. Heracles is real, and he lives right there. <laughs> So we go pretty back. much any time we went out, we went. We stopped them, even yeah. if we didn't need, even if we didn't need any game stuff at all. It's ah, like, because back then was a very important time in our lives because there was one thing I always needed, and that was another D twenty. That's right, but it's like any time we like left the apartment, it went down the street to like go to grocery and Millennium. Yeah, oh, to Bella's we'll, we'll and go, Millennium. Oh, DDR, a little yeah, right, and stop at Millennium on the way back. Yeah, Just all it, literally every time we went outside, might as well go to Millennium. So right there. what impressed me was not just how big it was and how good the selection was, you know, all the usual stuff, because this isn't a Tuesday show, it's a Wednesday show. What impressed me was how on some random day in the like pretty early in the day, how absolutely packed this gigantic store was. Every mm. aisle, every this place was absolutely rocking. Mm -hmm. So uh we uh, sold a bunch of games back to them, and they actually gave us a lot of money for those games. Like, way more money than I thought they would give us 
for the games that we gave them because they seem to keep a very curated selection. And while we were selling games to them, nerds walked over and stood around watching what we were selling and immediately tried to buy some of the games. And there was one game they wouldn't take. They're like, oh yeah, we wouldn't be able to sell that. And then this nerd's standing there and he just, he's like, and I say something like, oh, well, we'll, we'll donate it or like throw it away or something. And he's like, oh, but, 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 and he looks at us and I'm like, you want it? And he's like, what, really? And we just gave it to him. And we made that mm. dude's day. But the fa- it was like in the old days, you go to a blockbuster. Well, as a college student who probably has no money, he's yeah. like, a free game? Oh, my God. I mean, Rim in the year 2001, that would have been me. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, with that store credit, we bought a number of things. I bought a Tumblin dice, which is $100, but I feel like it's going to be worth it to bring to conventions. Like, that's, that's a worthwhile purchase with store credit. But two... Uh, I bought, we bought the fucking Clask because every pack, so we say, oh, should we buy the Clask? No, let's not buy the Clask. We bought the Clask. Emily and I are going to air hockey ourselves and become really good at Clask, so watch out. All right, well, good luck with that. <laughs> so you got any news? Uh, do I have any news? Yeah, so there's this Gundam Seed movie that just came out within the past year or so, right? And so if you don't know, there was the Gundam Seed TV show, the original one. Then there was Gundam Seed Destiny, which, every, which I barely watched. I watched like maybe a fraction of an episode. I don't even remember. And that is nearly universally reviled by Gundam slash anime fans. I don't know anyone. I've never heard anyone say, I really liked Gundam Seed Destiny in a sincere manner, right? It's everyone is pretty much just like keep saying it's garbage. It almost makes me want to watch it go back to it and see if they were wrong by my people, impression my like impression maybe of one it, person watched it said it was garbage everyone else just believed them and repeated it and no one watched it i don't know <laughs> i feel like because it did the same thing that uh tenshi muyo did with that gxp show where rock and opener well-known franchise but then you watch the first episode and you don't recognize even one character then you watch the second episode and it's still just all these characters you've never heard of and all the things you want to see aren't there and then you give up yeah. Anyway, I'm pretty sure it's garbage, <laughs> regardless, because you know I didn't couldn't even finish one episode. Yeah. Um, although I remember nothing of that episode. But also the final episode of the original show, man. like the first show, was fine and ended at a really good. Like I didn't need more. Gundam yeah. Seed told a pretty good Gundam story. Yeah. Anyway, this new movie, Gundam Seed Freedom, uh, is a direct sequel to Gundam Seed Destiny, so it just carries on. But supposedly, you don't really need to. Have Right? It's like, do you really need to know or not know? I don't know. I feel like you don't much- because the, the people who made this, they got to know. Especially because I remember hearing, and I can't confirm this either, that many of the characters that were absent from the, the first half of Destiny started appearing in later revised scripts. So, right. But anyway, the uh, so many, a lot of people saw this movie in Japan in theaters, which either means, A, a lot of people, or both, I guess. <laughs> um, either people... We're fans of Gundam Seed uh, in Japan and then went to watch this, and there were a lot of them. Or it was such a good movie, people went to see it even not knowing Gundam Seed, or both, um, because it did do well at the box office. So it comes to America, and there was a screening over at Japan Society, right? Like a North America almost premiere kind of deal, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, this is going to be... Some voice actors there and stuff, and I think I oh I think at the California one had some special guests because they were also on this in the country for Sakura Con, which was maybe having a screening, um in Seattle. So they were also going to L.A. to show it, and but they weren't going to be in New York. But anyway, the ticket prices for this thing were out of control. It was like forty bucks for a cheap ticket and like a hundred something bucks plus to watch a movie. It's like, are you out of your mind? They give you some swag as like, you know, limited edition swag if you buy those tickets. But the swag was worthless garbage that I would throw away if someone gave yeah, it to I me mean, for free. To me, swag is an anti-incentive because it's yeah. something I no, probably it, have to give away or throw away. It could be something good, right? For example. Yeah, give me a master this grade, uh, whatever the Gundam is that Lacus opens up at the end of the show. Well, but here's the thing, right? So for, there, was a, a fest, there was a Gundam festival in Japan somewhat recently where they where there was it was possible to get a limited edition wooden gun gun plot model. Okay, I would want that. I would want that. Right. I've seen pictures of the model. It's like, yeah, I want that. But it's like for forty bucks, it's like I'm basically buying the model and a movie ticket. That's an okay deal. A hundred bucks? No. No the model I wouldn't pay a hundred bucks for the model, so why would I pay for a hundred yeah, bucks for the model? Don't show me a, a giant robo in the theater and then give me an eye of Vogler. 
Yeah, it's like, it's not, no, forget it. Anyway, um, but the movie is coming to U.S. theaters far and wide at reasonable normal prices with the old Fathom Events <laughs> Crunchyroll deal uh, on May something. May 7th um, and May 8th. There you go. Rim opened the website. May 7th is the only subtitled screening, and May 8th is the only incorrect dubbed screening. That's right. So uh, May 7th is a Tuesday. So if you got nothing to do on Tuesday, May 7th, like me, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'll go see it, I think, because, uh, you know. But I mean, yeah. e- worst case, I go watch it. It's like, and I only, I don't understand some things because they were in Gundam Sea Destiny, and then who cares? I've watched many I'll, Gundam things I'll, over the years, not having the yeah. full context because I haven't seen. And every then I'll other give Gundam. a bad, re- then I'll give a bad review of it, and I'll be like, yeah, if you haven't seen Destiny, it makes no sense. Garbage movie, don't go see it. Or maybe it'll be comprehensible and good. So, funnily yeah. enough, some friends of ours who have gotten really into Gundam, uh, relatively recently, uh, had never watched Seed, and we were talking, oh yeah, let's let's do some Discord streams and like watch it because I can watch that show again. I like that show a lot. I have uh, all the DVDs. Yeah. So we were going to do a stream, but then I realized, I learned from them, they wanted to watch all of Gundam Seed and Destiny before this movie so they would have the full context to go see this movie. And uh, as much as I like Gundam Seed and like anime, I do not have the time or the will or the will or the wish to watch that much anime that it's not quickly. a 26-episode show. Yeah, it's, Gundam it's Seed by port- itself is 50 episodes plus some stuff. Yeah, it's, you can't be doing that. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> at, at this age. At this age, I could barely pull... The, even at RIT, I struggled to, to go to some marathons that I really wanted to go to. Because, like, it, there's sunlight outside and I want to ride my bike or something. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think they're, they're going to crash watch it on their own and all I have to say is good luck with all that. <laughs> By May seventh, you got you got a month. I guess I guess you could do it in a month if you watch three episodes a day. You'll oh no! Yeah. If you want to watch Destiny, also you got to watch like four or five episodes. I still a day. feel like, like you can probably just skip Destiny or just like read yeah, a we three or read four a summary. A day. I don't I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Seriously, just read the fucking cliff notes. It's like you know. Also, aren't there compilation movies you can watch for these things? I assume so, but I thought there were. I mean, half of what's great about Gundam Seed is that it does the thing where it has. You know, great music, but there's special music that only plays during very important moments in the show. And any time a song you don't recognize starts playing, it's like the end of a Fushigi Yugi episode. We're like, oh, shit, shit's going down. And then like they changed the, the closer. That's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then the mass driver scene happens or something. Yeah, anyway. So on uh, some other news, uh, if you're not aware... Superman first appeared not in a comic called Superman, but in a comic called Action Comics. Uh, And it was the first issue of Action Comics that had this character called Superman. Very simplistic idea for a superhero, but whatever. It was a long time ago, 1938. Uh, They only printed 200,000 copies of that. And in the year 2000... They don't even print 200,000 copies of new comics. (laughs) Right? (laughs) But uh, in the year 2024... About a hundred of those original printings exist today. Now, I'm not a fan of collecting in this manner. Uh, I think things like this should be in museums. Uh, That's a whole separate conversation. But uh, what's important is that you can read it and you can basically it's like it's not hard to just read a digital copy of it that looks a lot better than a paper one. So, yeah, really doesn't matter to me so much that like the paper copy, it's like. Okay. Yeah, Preserve I'd like it. Somewhere. I'd like a at least one paper copy to exist in a museum somewhere. That just feels appropriate. But uh, so someone bought one of these rare copies of Action Comics number one from someone who had one, and they bought it for six million U.S. dollars. Now I want I want to think for a second. There aren't even that many pages in this thing. Like this is an old timey comic book from the '30s. Uh, the number of dollars that were paid per square inch of Superman doing Superman things is just enormous and insane to me. Uh, I don't really have anything else to say. I just figured it was well, worth noting. I don't know how true this is, but I've heard people <laughs> lately talking about like, hey, why why do rich people keep doing this kind of thing? Oh, right? I, I have some 
professional opinions that uh, right. I can share in a very limited context. I have some personal yeah. opinions that I, I, mean, I should know not we, share heard... based on the nature of the work that I do in my day job. But there, there are stories I've heard in the past, you know, stories of money laundering, stories of trying to bump up auctions for other things, right? You know, and scams of that nature. But actually, I heard a new story, a story I hadn't heard before, right? Which is like, hey, these sort of, you know, very expensive items, famous artworks and whatnot, when rich people buy them, it's like there are some rich people who might be trying to display them in their homes temporarily or in other places to show off or something like yeah. that. That happens. Obvious. I might even do that if I'm wealthy. I, I would rent. I wouldn't. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I can understand buy. that. Like if I was wealthy right. enough to have a house that had like the exhibit room, I would have a collection of interesting items in that room. Yeah, and maybe I'd rotate it out just to keep it interesting. You know? Yeah, open it to the public. But, like, hey, come right. to my house if you want to see this thing. Yeah, check out my awesome house of collected things. I got, right? but the apparently there are like these registries where, very like certain items are like you know important enough or expensive enough to be put into like a registry, right? So like ah, this very special car, or this very special jewelry, or this very right. And when you purchase the item, you don't actually get the item, right? You don't actually. You know, it stays in the vault where it lives or wherever it is on the earth. You don't, you know, I guess you could theoretically say it's mine, give it to me, and they would. But you, all that really happens is you're getting your name, like, in this registry as being connected to that very important item. Um, and it's like, ah, yes, the such and such stone once belonged to... Wealthy person, right? See, now, that, unless they named it after me, like, oh, that's well, I guess you, <laughs> Rim Comics right? number one. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, I get, you know, rich people who, you know, some of whom, many of whom, you know, consider, like, just this number of how much they're worth and ex tie that number of monies to their self-worth, that tracks, if that's true, right? That they would also tie to their self-worth just some paper somewhere saying that they once owned the something and that could both enhance the value of the something depending if the rich person was famous enough like ah yes once owned by the sultan it's like oh well that makes this jewel more special or you know once the jewel was owned by the sultan and scott it's like oh yeah i'm in the league i'm in the same league as the sultan so scott touched that, the same thing that the sultan touched with his with a with well no a piece of paper has both of our names on it <laughs> mm, right and so rich people buy and sell to get on these registries of i guess to inflate their self-worth which is tied up with you know there's an adjacent material reason wealth. that you've probably heard of and a lot of people have heard of but uh there, there is a concept uh, that is separate from the whole money laundering and like wash trading conversations that happen with in certain sectors of art. There is the concept of using rare items as a store of wealth in that the, the argument. Now, again, I'm not giving a professional opinion here. I am simply stating an argument that is made broadly that you could Google for and thus uh, do not take this as investment advice from me. Uh the idea is that if a thing is rare enough, then it is very unlikely to go down in perceived value over time so that someone could use it as a store of wealth instead of putting money in a bank. Like, you could own the Mona Lisa, and then you sell it someday when you want to use that wealth for something, and it's a way to store wealth and store value in an object as opposed to in the market. Mm, as we got insurance and... It's not something that society stops caring about, you know, as long yep. as there is still... Because the insurance that, like, underwriter is going to make decisions like, all right, what are the odds over the next hundred years that nobody's going to give a shit about the Mona Lisa anymore? Like, what are the odds right. of that? And then Pretty they'll underwrite low. accordingly. Right. It's like you think Superman <laughs> is already, you know, li out Action Comics number one, people caring about it, has already outlived... Right, pretty much the people who made it, the, right, and a lot of people who are young when it was new, right. Not all of them, though, not yet. But yeah. it's like, it's it's got some staying power, and as long as it is staying power for your lifetime, right. It's like, well, people still care about Superman in a thousand years, maybe not. But as long as they care about Superman in seventy years, I'm probably not living seventy more years. So that's good enough. Yep. All right. Please. Even even the wealthy people aren't gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. But anyway, 
things of the day. So uh, this is this might be the nerdiest video that I've ever watched and enjoyed. To be very clear there. Like, I got more out of this than I thought I would. This video is titled, What is the Range of Sting's Orc Radar? And this is an 11-minute, very well-cited video that Are delves into... Are they doing into, movies or just book or what? Uh, canonical Tolkien sources only. So books only. Books only. And it goes okay. into specific passages across words that Tolkien wrote and is able to determine a actually shockingly specific range for how far away Sting can detect orcs. And I am impressed with the level of rigor that went into this video. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it. I want you to watch this 11-minute video if you want to know orcs, uh, sting, uh, uh, Sting's Orkdar, not Orc Stingdar. That's a whole different thing. Mm. But uh, you can actually, because of a handful, there's like one sentence in one place that in juxtaposed with a distance that is stated between two other places later, uh, and then Aragorn speculating, oh, it could be X. You're able to pinpoint this down to like a matter of dozens of feet. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, my head I mean, is off dozens to... of feet. I mean, just with me not knowing anything in the video or any of the- No, no, not the range is dozens of feet. That is, it's absolute range within a, an error of dozens of feet Okay. It's absolute range is actually pretty big based on something Aragorn says once. <laughs> All right. Uh, so there's a lot of word games out there. Word games are always hot, especially in English language. You know, crosswords have out have been around for a super long time, and they're pretty strong. Scrabble, despite issues we have with it, still a really strong game in terms of popularity, people playing it. Wordle, right? People love that shit. So here's a game someone made. Uh, that has not taken off. It's a free little <laughs> web game you can play at truncate.town. And I found in this word game some really interesting things going on. Is that like, it's normally in a word game when you're making words out of tiles, it's like you could only make legal words. Here, it's like, nah, go ahead. Make some make some illegal words if you want. Ooh. Right, Just throw down some letters. But that might give you a really weak position, you know? Uh, but it could be a, a little risk-taking position. And also, uh, it's a two-player game or a multiplayer game with some attacking and defense, right? Where, like, you know, there, we've seen that before. There, what, there is a, um, a Scrabble-like uh, game where there's attacking and defending. What was that one? Oh, do I, I played do not it. remember. I played it very briefly. Um, but this one's much more contained. And it's like, yeah, if you throw down, like, a five-letter real word and then i touch that shit with my six letter real word like i blow up your shit and basically the goal of the game is you're starting to make words that like you're part of the island and they're making words that they're part of the island you have to have like a contiguous chain connecting and then you're trying to hit their island to go bam right i, I word it all the way right it's a little push back and forth of wordiness um using the tiles you get and so i think it's it's actually you know i think it's better than bananagrams in terms of the speed aspect right but it also has sort of like the the spatial aspect that bananagrams doesn't include that scrabble has so uh this is uh this is not bad uh, i would try this out if you're a word game liker i like it i was i've been playing it while you were i like how the other players letters are upside down mm -hmm. all right in the meta moment the geek nights book club book the night is short walk on girl we're gonna do the episode pretty soon uh i don't yeah. have that much left to read so read the book. It's short. If you're really lazy, you can watch the movie, which covers more territory than the book for reasons that we can talk about a little bit in the book club show. Uh, we also did do a review of the movie, Walk on Girl, The Night is Short. I love that movie, and I really like this book. Mm. Otherwise, uh, uh, I'm thinking we'll about... Pax just... West in Seattle, kind of, maybe? Yeah, probably, Pax West likely. in Seattle. I'm very, very much planning to go to that, partly because... I want to do the panel we were supposed to do together, the good one. Uh, that just, I was really looking forward to doing that panel. Well, well, I'm likely to, you know, my work is having, a, you know, big, basically everyone, my work is entirely remote with people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And last year they were like, all right, everyone in September, we're going to get everyone in the whole company together in New York. I'm like, yes. And this year they're like, we're getting everyone in the company together in uh, exactly one week after PAX West in California. And I'm like, well, I'll be over there. To be. 
I'll just find a, a range of transportation of some kind. You know what you could do if you want to have some fun? Uh, I would recommend taking that scenic uh, Amtrak. We'll see who pays. That's what we'll see. Yeah, take that down the coast because I took that Amtrak. We'll see, we're, it's all going to depend on who pays for what, right? Because I took if one my year. My company doesn't pay. I'm just going right back to New York. In ancient, ancient times, there was a PAX West where an organization, Kaifu, uh, approached me and paid me my honorarium and all my travel expenses to travel after PAX to Portland to give a private lecture on game and UX design to this group. And it was super fun. So I took the Amtrak from Seattle to uh, Portland. And I really, really enjoyed that. Like, that was a great time. So I would yeah, recommend well, I mean, it if it works I do out. have many coworkers in Portland, so that is an option, is to go to where, you know, the, several coworkers, <clears throat> including the CEO, are in Portland. Uh, so I could go there and then go with them to California, right? Could be fun. Well, that, that's uh, one option. We'll very likely on also be at the PAX Unplugged. That'll happen sometime after that. Uh, we'll pretty much be at PAX unless things get in our way. I'll also tell you all now, I am strongly debating... Not just going to MAGFest, as we do every year, <clears throat> but uh, going to Mag Stock in June. Uh, mm. It actually looks pretty fun the more I looked into it, and uh, I'm going to make a decision in the next couple weeks. Yeah, so, uh, You know, it's like I could see some good parts, but I could also see potential for meh. And so I there's know. important things I learned. One... Everyone has access to showers, even people who are staying in tents. That was that's the not first. The that's not. That's not something I'm worried about. That was at the all. first and most important thing I was worried about. Okay. <laughs> it leans more into the concerts, but they do have like powered gaming areas and such. Yeah. Uh, but what I was really interested in is if you're in a cabin. Uh, the cabins aren't actually that expensive. Like, if you don't want to camp well, in a tent. Well, if you can get if you can fill the cabin with people, it's not that expensive. Yeah. So the the largest kind of private cabin you can get costs fourteen hundred dollars for the whole con and sleeps. Guess how many it sleeps? Probably like teens of thirty. People. Okay. It has thirty this. beds. Okay. So uh, stay tuned. I'm gonna look into this. I'll, I'll give you. I'll share with all, with all of you my assessment and my decision on whether or not I want to go to Megstock. And then uh, if other people want to go, we'll see what happens. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we're gonna try not to disrupt you guys. Use your tent and and not pay anything. Could do that too. But uh, I really like camping one or two nights in a tent. I don't know if I want to camp in a tent during a gaming convention and a music festival. For a long weekend, <laughs> I feel like I might want to be in a cabin. Though, if you do camp, the rules are pretty cool. You can camp anywhere on the grounds. It isn't like designated campsites. Just if pick a spot, that's yours. Uh, but everyone has access to showers and like facilities. Mm -hmm. They even have like a whole system to make sure you have places to like get power, even run power to your tent if you want. So, what's the, what's the food situation? There is a dining hall that you can opt into or cook your own food. Okay. I mean, how many days is it, though? Uh, I think three or four. Uh, I, I have mostly focused on the, are people going to be showered? And what does the sleeping and power <laughs> situation look like? I've spent about 25 minutes looking into the details of this con. Yeah, it just seems like logistically difficult, right? You have to make a mega Costco run before, right? Bring everything there. Yeah. Or just sign up for the, 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 I looked at, I saw some photos of the dining hall's food and it looked like it was about twice as good as what I remember band camp food to be, which is above the line of acceptable, but is just shy of good. <laughs> I've eaten much, much summer camp food in my life. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get right to the main bit. Emily and I watched the show quite some time ago. Uh, Scott watched it recently. So we can now yep. talk about it. It is the anime. No, you know, I got the, I'm trying to get through your Netflix so I can watch all the stuff on it and then stop paying for mm -hmm. it. So that was on my list. I got around to it eventually. I watch things eventually. Just I'm pretty you know, sure I, I geek bited it some time ago, but the Orbital Children. I just have no, there's no rush, right? It's a shame show that it was when it was new. Yeah. I saw it before I died. What's the big deal? Yep. I guess the, the, the important things about it were that one, it's on Netflix. It's from 2022. Uh, so it's a relatively recent anime. Two, it is a fairly hard sci-fi compared to a lot of anime that are set in space, like, say, Gundams. Uh, it, it does deal with some pretty direct, serious science fiction concepts in a serious, direct, and interesting way. Uh, it was written and directed by uh, uh, Mitsuo Iso, who, uh, not to get into his whole history, because I didn't know a lot about him, but if you go to his Wikipedia and you look at what he's worked on, 
He, it's that golden type of person to make a good anime. He has mostly done key animation for important anime over history, like End of Evangelion, Perfect Blue, Cowboy Bebop. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> the character designs are were uh, good by a person you might all recognize. Uh, uh, he also were like, this came out of him and Deno Coil. So there's a lot of reasons to check this show out. Yeah, and it's also only what six episodes. Yeah, it's not super long. It it yeah. doesn't fuck around. It introduces the world. It introduces the concept. the 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 inciting incident happens basically immediately. The mystery is introduced basically immediately. And by the end of this short show, every question is answered. Everything is resolved, and it's very satisfying. Mm. Yeah, so you got Orbital Children, obviously, just based on the title. It's like, oh, this is going to be about kids in space. And yeah, it's about kids in space. Yep. <laughs> um, and it's about a lot of concepts that you've seen in kids in space animes before, right? Especially Gundam, where you've mm. got, you know, the people who live in space against the people who live on Earth yep. and the conflicts between them and the fate of humanity or, or, or the destiny of, of the human race, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yep. Um, it's got, uh, the discussion, the typical discussion of is AI good? Is AI bad? Is AI just a very complicated and difficult thing for humans to deal with? Yep. Uh, and it's also got sort of the, you know, 2001 aspect of like, ah, oh, yes, this is, uh, you know, the space station and the tourism is a, uh, you know the space tourism and just people can just come up to space if they want to kind of yep. right and you know what's what's that like and also you know criticisms of you know earth government structures right there's like it's un2 yeah. right? it's like yeah the un1 it failed and we had now we have un2 to find out but it also it does something that i think is worth calling out because i didn't think about it until watching the show Generally, the best science fiction that I've read or watched over the years will have many science fiction con and speculative concepts in it, but will primarily focus on a smaller number of them for its deep analysis. But it will have the others there treated accurately, interestingly, and appropriately, even if it's not directly interrogating them. And some of the... Like, Sci-fi that is the top tier, S tier, tends to have all that there in the background, which gives you a more complex and holistic speculative world, but doesn't super delve on them. Like, worse yeah. science fiction addresses literally every concept fully and tends to be tedious, and Ray Bradbury tends to just pick, like, we're going to look at exactly one thing for 20 pages, and that's it. Nothing else exists. Yeah. yeah, here, it's like, you know, you see some concepts that are, you know, real and also you know, not real. Um, but it's like, there was an episode where a good, most of the episode was focused on just the danger of being in space, running out of oxygen, being sucked yep. into the vacuum, you know, dying, depressurizing, all those sorts of, you know, normal hard sci-fi things that happen every time someone's in space. Right. And, but is the show about that? Not at all, really. Um, but it is sort of necessary to sort of lock the setting in place. Um, force the characters into the right situations, mm -hmm. right? And and the relation force the relationships between the characters into, you know, certain arrangements. Um, because, you know, regardless of their differences, they have to work together to survive and this part and that so that way you can get yep. past that and so that the rest of the show can continue. Because if they were just perfectly safe and weren't forced to work together, then the show would have just been the direct conflict between the characters and their differences, who yep. wins the end. Now, interesting, because one of the concepts of the show might be humans, if not put under pressure and forced to work together, won't solve any of these problems. It could be. <laughs> yeah, not, I mean, it's a short show, so we're not going to, like, spoil super details of it. Like, I, I would recommend watching it. I think anyone who listens to Geek Nights, regardless of if you like anime, would enjoy this show. Unless you hate science fiction. Yeah, I mean, it's not, like, the best show i ever seen, but, like, I watched a couple episodes, then I'm like, oh, there's only four. Uh, yeah. Might as well. It's, it's, it, you know, good stuff's so, going on here. So the premise, where it starts, also, like, it, it hits the ground running, because it basically, it definitely implies that Earth is a capitalist dystopia-adjacent thing. Like, the kids are up in space, but, like, some of them are subsidized. Some of them are clearly influencers who are, like, part of an advertising campaign. Like, there's ads everywhere, like, in the space station. At one point, I remember, like, one of them 
<laughs> they use a mascot suit as like an evac suit because like that's the only thing they had around. Like there's that's a lot the of that. Old man. And that's then the old man who designed the station. Not just no, not just him. The, there's the there's the wife. There's the weird like pink suit that the one girl puts on at one point. Because, oh, like, that's the, just the, that's the like the tutorial suit. Yeah, because people don't know how to. Right. It's like because the station was set up as like a place for tourists when they're trying to survive. It's like, ah, yes, we'll have to use these. You know, they, they like make use of like the tourist equipment mm. that's th that was meant for it to be a tourist attraction as survival equipment. Right. So like there's like an evac, uh, 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 an EVA, you know, attraction, which is like where tourists would go out and do a spacewalk. Right. Well, it's like, oh, well, we need to use the tourist spacewalk suits to go out because we don't have anything else. And one of them is like meant for one of them is just a ball meant to put children into. <laughs> one of them is uh, like, you know, a tutorial one that's like does everything for you. Right. Yep. And then there's like a, and then there's like some real ones that they have. So, but basically like the premise where it starts is, so you got this influencer, you got some kids, kids who were born in space versus kids who were born on earth and the differences between them. You got genetically engineered kids versus Less genetically engineered or normal kids. I don't think they were. They weren't genetically engineered, but because they were born in space, they had these implants put into mm. them so that they could survive in space. But the implants were also a problem. Yep. Um, and then you know, it's but, like that's basically the, like the main plot is is what. So up it sets that. all these kids up. Uh, there's like people are on the station. Things are going fine, and then. A bunch of stuff happens at once, and you, the, you only see things from the perspective of the people on the space station. So imagine you're up on a space station, and then, like, there's weird radio chatter from Earth, and then, like, a nuke gets launched, and you don't know where that nuke is targeted. You just find out, yeah, Earth just launched a bunch of nukes somewhere, and then, like, a comet or some debris or something hits your space station and cuts off communication. So now you're on a space station. Uh, all the emergency systems are in effect. You've lost contact with Earth. And all you know is a bunch of nukes went off right before this happened. What the fuck yep. do you do? I, I think that's probably actually my favorite aspect of the show, right? There's too many things out there that, you know, stories, artworks, whatever, where they show something from, like, you know, multiple perspectives to sort of give you the whole picture of what's going mm. on right and you you or even if they don't do it immediately they, they like they can't hold back and like halfway through they're like okay here's what the other side is guys right it's like to hold that the whole show to the end yeah you don't right? find out what was up on earth until the end of the show right it's like you literally throughout the whole show only know what you know even at the, the you know on earth at the end of the show it's still you only know what these characters that are the main characters know you don't know anything else ever uh there are several characters so it's not like a half-life 2 where like you only know what gordon freeman knows yeah it's not limited to that extent but it's like the only people on the space station are the the two kids that live there the woman that takes care of them the three tourist kids that come up the old man who designed the station and is in like a mascot suit. Yep. And then there's three people who are like the, I guess like the commander and the co-pilots of the, of the space station. But even them, they're sort of like off to the side. It's mostly that first group. Yep. Um, and the old man is really just sort of like, he might as well be the cute animal character. I think that's <laughs> why they put him in the, the mascot suit, right? He's sort of like the Pikachu. Um, <laughs> He he doesn't really count that much. He only really comes into play like he's actually mostly in play in the first episode, and then like one other time, and then they sort of hide him off to the side. And it's like I'm like I think that guy's more significant. You said he designed most of the station, but he's old and has like sort of this you know uh, Alzheimer's that comes back and comes in and out, and sometimes he can't remember things, and then suddenly he's just fine. Other times, and then they just sort of forget about him at some point it's like what the hell yeah uh maybe not do that i don't know no, they i want to know more about that old man i guess they had more pressing concerns like human instrumentality <laughs> i guess so yeah because what's interesting is again having recently watched pluto i would say one of the main themes of this show that it addresses pretty much head-on is the same core idea that pluto deals with if there's gonna be ai's restricting them versus not restricting them is a binary choice that has extreme consequences in both directions. Like that's a core theme of this. Right. 
Yeah, but, they seem to like right, basically the humans in this world have like decided, you know, clearly AIs are people, right? They haven't it's like it's yep. it's clear, right? There isn't like this debate about it, you know, like you would have in an older sci fi's, right? But here it's like there's like you know, they're restricting the cognition of the AIs because if the AIs get too smart, it'll be like a Skynet situation. Yep. Partly and because so like, they had an AI, and this is revealed pretty early in the show, that is like a case study that the UN got involved with because it was really smart and it got weird and possibly dangerous and they had to shut it down because it basically appeared it basically just said to its handlers yeah, we have to. We're gonna reduce Earth's population by X percent, and then it seemed to try to execute on that mission. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously, right? They actually managed to avert disaster in yep. their eyes. Right? So now they've got um, restrictions on AI, and like the UN has a whole thing about AI, and that is central to the plot. Yeah, it's like it's like the AIs are smart or smarter than people, and the people work in concert with them, but they don't let the AIs become ultra smart because the one that did become ultra smart basically sort of became godlike like you know people like worship it and like they have like this like they talk about like the poem that the mm. ai that got out of control was like this it's called seven and they're like oh yeah the seven poem it's sort of like the bible or like a nostradamus thing that predicts the future now i'm right? gonna say uh, i think we're gonna see actual humans in real life act like that in regard to some machine learning model within the next three or four years mm, maybe i don't know um but it's like, yeah, it's like, what if there was an AI that wasn't just some bullshit human mimic thing like we have now that isn't, you know, I would argue in a lot of yeah. cases isn't AI, um, but is actually a, you know, a general intelligence and is actually way, way smarter than we are, right? Yeah, because uh, think about it, it, we... It starts, right, and it starts doing things. It's like, should we trust it? Um, and, you know, and B... It like developed a, in this world. A, one of the big questions that the show asks is: there was a lot of technology developed by the godlike AI, and no one understands it. And because all the other AIs are limited, those other AIs don't understand that technology either. Mm -hmm. So anything they still use the some of the really useful things that old AI made, and right, sort of like how in Macross they have the ship. That's from the... the oh, yeah, um, it is like Macross. Right. The Macross is basically a spaceship that comes from, uh, right, the... What's it called? The the Surveyor? The whatever? The... the I forget the name of the alien race that made the Macross. It's not the Zentradi who may... Who are the, attacking the Macross, right? <laughs> Oh, the Supervisor. That's who... I think it's the Supervisor military? Anyway. But the Macross itself was made by this other alien race. They fix it up, and they learn about it, but, like, they don't really, you know... It's it's they're using unknown stuff. So what if instead of aliens bringing unknown stuff and us using it, an AI makes unknown stuff, and now that AI is gone, and now no one can repair or work on or yep. understand that technology, but you're still using it. But also everyone side eyes it a little bit because everyone thinks back to what the crazy AI that they shot down did and said. <laughs> Right, like imagine if I went back in time to like the early 20th century with just like a box of iPhones and a cell tower and then and then went away. <laughs> <laughs> just like, well, how would that go? And I guess the other thing that this heads, hits pretty head on is a concept in, not, not like Evangelion instrumentality, but more about the concept of a technological singularity. Is there a difference between humans and humanity does that difference mm -hmm. matter, and are they both important? And it answers mm -hmm. those questions in a very nuanced way. Like, it, it's a—watch the show. I think it addresses it pretty well, and I think it'll leave you thinking. And I don't think it has a very strong conclusion about everything, but I think it, it, it's going to introduce a lot of food for thought if you've never read much about what the singularity might entail. Yeah. So, you know, if you like a sci-fi anime and a terrible secret of space or a terrible secret of Earth or whatever, yep. um, I guess it's not a secret of space, even though it's in space. Yep. But if you very um, specifically, if you've been burned by media that doesn't just answer what the secret is by the end, this one answers it. At the end, you not, I don't know. think I, well, I would, on that point, I would differ. I, I would say I don't like it when the, the secret is just, you know, revealed. In uh, this case, I, I do only because. This way, yeah, it's fine. But well, I think the show like, here you know, is specifically the question, answering the secret opens the new question of, all right, humans, 
<laughs> your move. What do yeah. you do with that information? Right. It's like everyone loves that stupid, you know, Christopher Nolan guy, right? But like, uh, what was the the space one he did? I saw. Oh yeah, um, I, I I actually didn't see it. Uh, I mean, you might like it, but I, don't I I'm, I'll watch it at some point. I know I'll like it. Uh, what the hell? I like tedious uh, space nonsense. Uh, Interstellar, yeah, right, that one where it's like, yeah, it's got a terrible secret of space, and then at the end, they explain the entire terrible secret of space explicitly. They're like, this is what it was, and I'm yeah, like, yeah, well, I guess I don't, I'm, I'm just like, eh, eh. It, I, I guess overrated. I'll put it this way good media that has a terrible secret for space either has to answer it in a way that is actually satisfying and lives up to whatever you were thinking, which is very hard to do, or Answering it opens another, even more interesting question, or doesn't answer it, usually because the point of the show is more like Evangelion around, that question was stupid. Here's a different question you should have been asking. Yeah, I think still the best terrible secret of space movie ever is still 2001, which mm. is just like, ah, fuck it. Here's some psychedelic imagery. Bitches. <laughs> and that is vastly superior. Right. But was the answer was, also not pretty direct of, oh, they, they took a human and decided to uplift them just like what the monolith they showed you in the beginning. And here's here's a psychedelic nonsense way to portray that. But that's what it is. That's that's uninterpretation. But I think that's by just showing abstract imagery uh, of that nature. Right. And just sort of they, they leave you to your own interpretation. There is no right or wrong answer of what actually happened. Right. And. The book, when I guess you, the book's when you, a when you give an answer, dr- you're not tech- leaving that space for the viewer to the, the audience to be challenged and mm. also to have to look inside themselves for an answer, right? Mm. Instead of seeking out an answer from elsewhere. Well, I guess in this case, then that's in part 2001, of why... it's, it's you only can get answers from yourself. <laughs> I guess then why this works here for orbital children to take it from that angle is that when you find out like what happened, that makes you ask questions you weren't thinking about asking up to this point in the show. Yeah, it's not bad, but I'm just saying it's, you know, if you like that sort of thing, you can get it in six episodes, which I think is a great lesson for everyone out there who takes fucking 26 plus episodes to do this. (laughs) It's much better when you do it in less, right? You don't actually need to build up, you know, the whole time. Right, if you're not using that time valuably, you can just do it in you know, if you're if your finale of your show is, you know, you're gonna start getting terrible secrety in the last two or three episodes, you don't need more than two or three episodes to set up before that of <laughs> the normal part. You don't need twenty episodes normal part, right? Six episodes weird part. We can do three and three. It's fine. Right? Don't waste our time. That I can watch more shows that way. It's on Netflix. You don't need to make a whole T V season for television no one watches that anymore you'll save money on production it's fine 